Hello everyone, Man Bun Pig here. Yes, I am much more powerful than the original. Welcome one and all to another bunch of pixels that are just mushed together into a conglomerate of nonsense that you just happen to watch. Today we're gonna to be looking at one of my favorites, if not my favorite movie of all time, Coraline. Now, I'm always on the fence when I consider, you know, favorites, because let's be real, that really all depends on the day, not really your entire life. One day, one thing could be your favorite, the next day, another thing could be your favorite. But if I would have to list my top five favorite movies, Coraline would definitely be near the top. And not only for me, but for my wife, this is 100% her favorite movie. One of my first songs I've ever made was called Grey, and this song was heavily inspired by Coraline. It's actually up on Spotify right now. So there are a lot of things that me and my wife have a connection to with this movie so I'm going to do my best to review this movie justice. Ever since I was a kid I always loved the concept of stop motion movie. You know Nightmare Before Christmas, James and the Giant Peach. You could even consider Monster House in that style of category. It's not stop motion but it has that animation style. And it's weird because I hate horror movies. I genuinely do but I love creepy atmospheres you know without the cringe jump scares and I'm always skeptical when I review movies that I personally love because I feel like, you know, a lot of people tend to like me talk about things that I don't like. But I'm actually surprised because with the past few videos, you guys have proved me wrong in that idea. And I'm very thankful for that, that I could actually talk about things that I actually enjoy sometimes. So Coraline is a movie directed by Henry Selleck, the wonderful man behind movies such as James and the Giant Peach and The Nightmare Before Christmas. And I know a lot of you are probably confused. You're like, wait, that's Tim Burton. There's like a weird stigma behind stop motion movies where everyone just, you know, assumes Tim Burton. Because let's be real, Tim Burton is a huge stigma staple in the stop motion community. So pretty much any time a movie is creepy and it has stop motion, it's Tim Burton. But Henry Selleck have created some of the best movies ever out of stop motion. But this movie was based off a novel, which I did not read, but my wife did. And from what my wife tells me, the novel is way more based on the horror and scary elements. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, Coraline the movie is very much a horror movie and very terrifying, but the book tends to have a lot more dark elements to it. And I mean, which makes sense because Coraline is somewhat of a kid's movie in a way, so it kind of fits. One thing this movie does, which I feel like stop motion does a great job at doing, is hitting that middle ground of comfortable, but feeling alone at the same time. You feel scared, but it's like a comfortable scared. I mean, not just the plot or the art style, but also like the soundtrack. It's very melancholic and whimsical. It's charming, but at the same time, it has that like off-putting sound to it. And the setting of the movie has such a strong sense of isolation from the outside world, but at the same time has a lot of very interesting, fun characters within this small world. So it makes that feeling of being alone a little bit more comfortable. It's almost like depression in a way. I mean, I don't necessarily know if that's what they were going for, but I feel like depression and anxiety can parallel to this idea because of the feeling of like being alone even when there's people around you and you're surrounded by people. You know, not fitting in with everything around you. But before we get into this movie, I just want to mention, if you have not seen Coraline. Go watch it right now. This is the one, I'm, I'm, I've said it a couple times, but this is, this is the one time I'm being very serious. Please go watch Coraline. It's a fantastic movie. Do it. You, you watched it? Okay, let's move on. Hey, pig, how's it going? Huh? Oh my gosh, Shawnee, it's been such a long time. Now get the f*** out of my house. Oh, uh, you know me just running from the law because of the whole bootleg movie thing. So uh, I was just wondering, uh, can I crash you for a bit? Great, it was PETA, then it's the I can fix that guy, then it was the doctor, now you? Come whoa, on! Whoa, 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 what do you mean the doctor? I don't know, just some dude that's in a white coat that keeps telling everyone that he's a doctor? We all know he's not. Does he put on a really bad British accent? You can't really tell what accent it is. Oh, yeah. Awful accent. Like, no one knows what it is. God damn, listen, pig, I'm telling you, this guy's bad news, okay? You shouldn't mess with this guy. So that, okay, so that's implying that you're any better than him. Uh, can you just get out of my house, please? All right, well, it's kind of late for that. I did already put my mattress upstairs. Oh, I dare to ask. Your mattress? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I bring my mattress everywhere I go. I love my Helix mattress. Oh, dear God, I do not like where this is going. Well, you see, Helix makes customized mattresses that fit your body type set right to your door. Everybody's different, and Helix realizes that. That's why they have this sleep quiz that helps you figure out what type of mattress you need. Now, me personally, I enjoy sleeping on my stomach. You know, sometimes Peter comes in and cuddles me a little bit. Yeah, 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 you know? Gross. And I ended up getting matched with the Dusk Lux version. And let me tell you, I'm sleeping on this baby for about a month and I'm, I'm kicking baby. Look, 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 I'm glowing. I'm glowing with 
fresh. And the best part about this whole thing, they send it right to your door for free. It comes rolled up in a box. It's super easy to set up. I mean, sure, that, um, I mean, I kind of use your address because I, I don't really have an address. Okay, is that why I found an entire wheel of cheese sitting at my doorstep one day? Hey, whoa, whoa, you found my cheese? All right, well, we're gonna talk about that after. But if anybody watching wants a mattress, make sure to click that link in the description. Go to helixsleep.com slash pig. I had to use uh, your name because of you know, legal reasons. And hey, if you're a little bit worried about buying something like this, Helix gives you a 100 night sleep trial. So you get more than three months to make sure that you love it. So I'm gonna go take a sleep on my Helix mattress and then kind of search for this doctor guy you're talking about because he's bad news. If it's the guy you're talking, he's bad news, right? So the movie starts out with us watching the perspective of some metal hands taking apart a, a doll and changing it into a doll that ends up looking exactly like the main character Coraline. And something that I didn't notice and a lot of other people probably didn't notice the first time you watch it is that the doll she takes apart in the beginning of the movie before she turns it into Coraline is actually a very important thing. We will reference this later on. So then we see a moving truck which on the back of it says stop mo rules which is hilarious. It drives up to an apartment building called the Pink Palace and they start moving a bunch of stuff. In. They end up getting a dollar tip, and on that dollar is not George Washington, but in fact, Henry Selleck's face on the bill, which I thought was funny. You'll notice throughout this movie, there is so much attention to detail and things that a lot of people missed when they watched this movie, and I'm going to try to go over as much as possible. But let's be real, there's so much, I doubt I'll be able to get all of it. Then we meet Coraline, who walks out to a gray and dreary landscape. She's apparently searching for a well and runs into another kid, who is unfortunately named YB. Yes, short for why born. A kid's gonna grow up with a lot of goddamn problems. And something that this movie does really well and why my wife relates to this movie immensely is how everyone kind of treats Coraline like a nuisance and kind of not important. Everyone ignores her. Everyone gets her name wrong constantly. They call her Caroline instead of Coraline because my wife's childhood was literally this growing up. You know, people treated her indifferently. They didn't really pay attention to her every time she talked. Not really anyone listened. And I feel like a lot of people deal with this type of thing and no one really talks about it. I see a lot of Coraline in my wife and my wife in Coraline by the way of her imagination and her personality kind of shines through like the dreary landscape. She's like surrounded by everything that feels gray and things that ignore her and don't like her, but she kind of shines through all of that. Just like the movie, Coraline wants to be colorful. She wants to be bright. She wants to be creative. She wants to be different in a world where she's surrounded by gray and dull things. So it kind of makes it hard for her to relate to anything else. So anyway, YB gets called home, mentions to Coraline that the stick she's holding is poison oak. Then Coraline goes to talk to her parents. And this is where we see her parents and they're both gardeners or I mean, I, I think they, they write articles about plants. So they're like, Gar garden writers, I don't know. And they both kind of neglect Coraline, you know, they're focusing on their work, they're trying to make money, and every time Coraline comes in or talks, it's always like, oh, please go do something else, you're annoying me type thing. To the point where Coraline even tells her mom, hey, I almost fell down a well and died today, and her mom's response was, that's nice. So Ivy ends up leaving her a gift at the doorstep, and lo and behold, that gift is the doll that looks exactly like her. Hmm seems a bit sus might want to vote out that doll no no it are, are we past are we past among us memes oh god Coraline kind of just brushes it off and goes to talk to her dad you know with the same result he basically tells her hey please do anything you can to get away from me. Gives her a little notebook and tells her to go count windows indoors in the house. So Coraline, bored and alone, she walks around the house, starts counting windows, and oh, starts killing some bugs she found. That's that's cool. And she also notices a boring painting of a kid. And I just want to mention the killing of the bugs and that little picture of the kid on the wall, actually important information. Yeah, I know, the, the, those very minute things are actually important. And then she notices that her doll kind of just appears in front of a small locked door. So Coraline, curious, begs her mom to find the key. So her mom finds the key, which is a button key, 
opens it. It turns out just a brick wall behind the door. So Coraline, bored and sad, falls asleep. Then all of a sudden she hears a mouse and that mouse leads her to the little door. And lo and behold, now the little door that used to be full of bricks has a huge purple tunnel. So obviously Coraline being curious goes through the tunnel. And this is similar to James and the Giant Peach. You know, that tunnel, basically like a transition between worlds, like how James was walking through the tunnel and turned into a cartoon. You could consider it a passage to a different world, or you can consider it the esophagus of a horrible monster that's about to eat her. But you know, that's up for debate. So she ends up in a complete copy of the world that she was, except everything in this world is colorful and happy. Even the sad picture of the boy that was on the wall is now smiling. She walks into the kitchen to see her mom and dad, except they're not her mom and dad. They have buttons sewn in their eyes. So the mom and the dad end up calling themselves the other parents, the other mother and the other father. So her father plays her a little ditty by letting the piano control his fingies. And actually something that not many people realize or will notice with this movie is if you pay attention to the lyrics that he's singing, he's actually giving her a buttload of warning signs about what is about to come if she stays here and basically warning her to leave. But obviously she just got here. She's not going to catch on to super vague lyrics. So she she ends up bypassing that, eats some dinner, and then she kind of starts getting a little bit suspicious, like, why is everything too perfect? You know, everything's starting to feel a little bit too good. But she kind of just, you know, throws that thought away, and then her other parents end up tucking her into bed. And the other mother puts some mud on her poison ivy in hopes that it would help her. And she wakes up, but this time she wakes up in the actual real world. So obviously she's like, oh, hey, this is just a dream. But she notices the poison ivy that was on her hand earlier is gone. So she tries to explain to her parents that it happened and, and obviously, you know, they're not going to believe her. So then her mom tells her to go visit the neighbors and go meet them. And then we get to meet one of my favorite characters in the movie, the amazing Bobinski, an eccentric Russian man who is hell bent on making an amazing mice circus. He, like everyone else, calls Coraline Caroline, living up to the idea that everyone ignores her. And she drops off Mr. Bobinski's cheese. And as she's about to leave, Bobinski, almost getting his balls cut off, Bobinski tells Coraline that his dancing mice told him to give her a message. And that message was, don't go into the little door. Very ominous indeed. So then she goes to see her other neighbors, Miriam and April, two old theater ladies, one with big bagoingas, and the other who stuffs all of her dead dogs and puts them on display. Yeah little bit morbid and once again they both end up calling Coraline Caroline so these theater ladies are a little bit into like the witchcraft and like telling your future type stuff so April decides to read Coraline's tea leaves to tell her her future and her tea leaves end up showing that she's in grave danger and a hand appears but then Miriam kind of off puts us like no it's a giraffe so we basically have two neighbors both of them warning Coraline to not go into the little door and that she's in danger. So not only that, but YB once again appearing out of the mist tells her that the dolls he gave her is older than the house itself. So why does the doll look like Coraline? Not only that, but he told Coraline that grandma's sister apparently disappeared and she believes that she was stolen by someone and it has something to do with the house. All of this while Coraline's doll is ominously staring through the window. So after all of those warnings, Coraline still goes back that night, and this time it's a spectacle. First, she goes to the garden to see an amazingly colorful garden plant display that ends up shaping her face. Next, she goes with a mute YB. Yes, the other mother created a YB that physically can't talk, which obviously, you know, Coraline likes. And they go to see the amazing Bobinski. And this Bobinski isn't, you know, the, the cracked out, wild, eccentric Russian man. He is a very clean and very talented mice circus guy. So obviously the things in the other world seem like they're just getting better and better every time she goes back. And in the real world, things kind of get worse and worse every time she goes back. Her mom ends up locking the little door because she ended up finding mouse poop. And not only that, but her mom takes Coraline out to shop for school clothes and Coraline just wants to buy some colorful gloves because their uniforms are literally just gray. And obviously her mom says no. So they get home and her mom realizes they don't have any food and Coraline is obviously not happy. So her mom, feeling a little bit guilty about it, she ends up telling Coraline that she'll make it up to her and then leaves to go get groceries. So Coraline takes this opportunity while she's alone to go grab the button key and unlock the door. And this is confirming to herself that it was real all along. It wasn't just a dream because the tunnel is there. Or the esophagus of a bell dam. I mean, could be either one. So the other mother again made her amazing food, sewed her some awesome clothes, and on her way downstairs, Coraline runs into the cat. But this cat, 
cat isn't from the other world. This cat can actually walk through worlds because apparently the other mother does not like cats. And in this world, the cat can talk. And once again, Coraline gets warned. The cat telling her like, you know, everything seems nice, but it ain't. So the cat hears something, runs away, and Coraline goes and watches the two theater ladies put on an amazing show. So after Coraline sees all these amazing shows, eats all this awesome food, she goes back and she's about to go back to the real world. But the other mother offers her to stay there forever. And then she offers her a present. And that present is two buttons. So she implies that the only way that Coraline can stay there forever is if the other mother gets to sew buttons into her eyes. Yeah little bit uh a little bit creepy and this is where the threads start to come loose <laughs> see see what i see what i did because so Coraline, in a panic forces herself to go to sleep hoping you know she'll go to sleep she'll wake up in the real world but unfortunately she wakes up and she's still in the other world and this is where everything starts to get a little bit creepier she walks in to see her other father looking exhausted and almost in pain and the hands in the piano seem to not want the dad to talk. He pulled a long face and mother didn't like it. Uh. So Coraline, obviously terrified and confused, runs far away from the house and the cat follows her. And the cat tells her that the world stops after the house because the other mother only created what Coraline wanted to see. And apparently after walking outside of the world, the world just kind of brings itself back in front of her. So Coraline decides that, you know, she's in a bad place. She's got to take some action. So she goes and breaks open the locked door blocking the exit. But then she walks in a room filled with bugs. There's a a bug dresser there's a bug chair and even the other mother is eating bug chocolates there's even bug wallpaper and this is what i was talking about with the bugs earlier in the movie how they kind of are important there is this theory called the bug theory when it comes to Coraline. throughout the movie there's a lot of references to bugs Coraline's parents are gardeners in the beginning of the movie Coraline kind of kills a bunch of bugs Coraline has a praying mantis picture stand Coraline's other dad is riding a praying mantis not to mention Coraline wears a bug hairpin the entire movie. Not only that, but the car that Coraline's parents drive is a Volkswagen Beetle. And if you want to know more about this bug theory and learn more about it, a YouTuber named Karsten Runquist, I hope I said that right, made a very detailed video about this very same theory. So I would recommend going to watch that to kind of get an idea of what this bug theory is about. Because I feel like if I start talking about this bug theory, it could go on for a long time. So I would just go watch his video if you want to learn about it. Basically, what I'm saying, like I said before, this movie has so much untold f***ing details. So Coraline ends up standing up for herself and telling her other mother she wants to go back to her real mom, and she don't like that. So the other mother kind of turns into a very skinny, long, very long neck, almost similar to a giraffe, which I just want to mention Miriam mentioned that in the tea leaves earlier on, you know, the, the giraffe thing, which could have been foreshadowing and a reference. And then she ends up throwing Coraline into a mirror. And this is where we really start learning about the other mother. She finds three lone spirits who refer to the other mother as a bell dam, which is another term for witch or um, an old, ugly, malicious woman. <laughs> And as it turns out, these three spirits are children from the past that actually let the other mothers sew buttons into their eyes. A tall girl, a short boy, who I believe is the sad boy in the painting at the beginning of the movie at the real house, and a small girl with pigtails, which looks exactly like the doll from the very beginning of the movie. So we could safely assume that she was the most recent victim. So the souls explain to Coraline that she spies on them with the doll's eyes, you know, the Coraline looking doll. And then she baits children in with promises of, you know, treasures, and good food and love and all that different stuff. And then Coraline discovers that not only does she need to get out of this hell, but she needs to find the three eyes of these children that are lost in this world in order to set their souls free and defeat the Bell Dam. So then all of a sudden, hands come out of the wall and snatch Coraline. Turns out it was Mute Wybe. He pulls her out of the mirror, helps her get back to the small door, and when Coraline asks him to come with, Oh, what's that? It looks like the other mother's starting to literally turn his body into dust. So Coraline makes it out alive, and she ends up running into the real YB, and then YB explains to her that the doll that he gave her was actually his grandma's sister's doll, the one that disappeared. So that little girl spirit with the pigtails in the beginning of the movie that she ended up making into a Coraline doll is actually YB's grandma's sister who went missing a long time ago. So after Coraline scares off YB by, you know, explaining actually what's going on, 
on, she realizes that her parents aren't home. She goes to talk to the two old theater ladies once again, and they end up just not really helping. They end up just giving her a trinket to help her find her lost parents. They say it helps her find lost things, which obviously at the time seems like a pointless gesture that really won't help anything. So Coraline lays in bed with makeshift parents that she made out of pillows and cries herself to sleep. But then she wakes up in the middle of the night to a cat who you know, the cat who could walk through worlds. And the cat shows her that her parents are trapped in the mirror. And then she sees that the doll that the Bell Dam controls was actually made into her parents. So now she has her parents. So Coraline burns that doll and goes back to the other world to face her. And on the way there, the cat tells Coraline that the only way she could win is if she challenges the Bell Dam to a game because she can't say no to a game. So she gets back to the other world and shit is just weird and creepy. Well, I mean, more than it already is. The other dad walks out completely bloated disfigured his mouth is all messed up his body's all messed up the other mother did a really big number on him because obviously you don't really notice it your first watch but if you really pay attention to it the entire time the other dad all he was trying to do was help Coraline and the mother caught on to that and he got in trouble so Coraline ends up making a bet with the other mother that she could find the three eyes of the lost children and her parents before the day is up and if she can't find them she will let the other mother sew buttons into her eyes but if she wins everyone gets set free so the other mother ends up giving her a hint in each three wonders I've made for you a ghost eye is lost in plain sight and then she makes a deal with just a sick ass audio transition and for my parents <laughs> <gasps> so she realizes that the three wonders she made for her is the garden mr bobinski's show and the two uh theater ladies so first she walks into the beautiful garden which uh is now just a horrific death trap plants start attacking her try to pull her down a well she ends up barely getting away and then some big ass mosquitoes yoink that little trinket that the theater ladies gave her so obviously curious as to you know why the hell do they want this she looks through it to find that everything in the world is gray except a glowing ball which turns out to be one of the children's eyes and then it's preceded by one of the coolest jump scares See this right here, this is a good jump scare, okay? Take notes, people, take notes. So the other father, who now has basically been turned into a pumpkin, attacks Coraline while the entire time telling her that he's sorry and that the other mother is making him do it. So we can confirm right here, the entire time, all the other father wanted to do was try to save Coraline, but in the end, he was just turned into a puppet for the Beldum to use against Coraline. So as the bridge starts to collapse and the other father starts falling into the water, with his dying breath, he takes the child's eye and hands it to Coraline, telling her to take it, and then he falls to his death. So the next wonder that Coraline goes to is a theater, and she sees that the child's eye is inside a little taffy candy wrapper. And as she goes to grab it, she gets snatched by a taffy version of the theater ladies. But she ended up being able to escape their grip by using the dog bats, yes, dog bats, to get them off of her. So she has two of the child's eyes. She has one more to go, and the final location has to be one of the creepiest portions of this movie, I guess in my opinion. It's the amazing Bobinski. She walks up to his house to find the clothes of the other wife be hanging on a pole. Rest in peace, other YB. So she goes into Bobinski's house to find the amazing Bobinski, or at least um, the clothes of Bobinski being controlled by rats who somehow are able to combine together to speak to Coraline. Yeah. This is some goddamn nightmare feel. So the rats end up taking the child's eye and Coraline throws her little trinket to try to knock the rat down, but misses. So she loses the rat, loses the eye and loses her trinket. So obviously she's like, it's over, I lose. But boom, guess what? The cat came back, the cat grabbed the rat, boom, bam, she's got all three eyes. So after she collects all of the kid's eyes, the other mother's world just kind of starts falling apart because she was feeding off the souls of these kids in order to give her power to do this stuff. And with them being gone, now she's just very weak. She goes inside to find wallpaper peeling off the wall, which is a really cool effect. Furniture falling apart. Everything's kind of just looks awful. And then she sees what is the final form of the mom. Turns out it's reminiscent of the metal hands that we saw in the beginning of the movie and all she is is kind of just bone and like a cracked face with like metal hands. So the bell dam throws her trinket in the fire because she doesn't want her to use it anymore obviously. And Coraline gets told by one of the children that she needs to be clever because there's no way in hell the beldam will actually let her leave even if she wins. So Coraline thinking on her feet tells the bell dam that her parents are 
her behind the door, the door that leads to her world. So the Beldum turns around at Coraline, you know, like, hey, yeah, I won. I won. But Coraline finds her parents and ends up throwing the cat in the Beldam's face. And the cat was able to rip off her button eyes so she couldn't see. So in a rage, the Beldam makes the entire room into a spider's web and she herself basically turns into a spider. I assume it was a way to just be able to find Coraline, you know, using the vibrations of the web to find Coraline. But Coraline somehow was able to crawl her way through the tunnel as a Beldam screams and slams the door exclaiming that she's gonna die without her. So Coraline locks the door and she's safe for now. She sees her parents, but her parents obviously don't remember anything that happened. They just kind of act like normal. So everything kind of seems good. So Coraline goes to sleep, and then she has a dream where the souls that she saved tell her that she's not done yet. Because the button key that she still has, the Beldam will find a way to get it and still wreak havoc. So she walks in the night to take the key to the old well to drop it in there. But the hand of the Beldam that Coraline broke off when she was trying to run away ends up making it to the real world and following her. And before she could toss the key in, the hand grabs her and starts dragging her and the key back to the house. But YB, of all people, end up coming in, saving the day by destroying the hand with a rock, and then they throw the rock and the hand down the well. So the movie ends with Coraline, her parents, and all of the neighbors getting together for like a little outside party in the garden. And then Coraline finally meets Wybie's grandmother. And then the movie ends with her telling his grandmother that she has so much to tell her. Boom. Coraline explained in much detail as necessary. Hell, I, I might have even explained it more than necessary. And that's the thing. I feel like I explained as much as possible and there's still so much that I haven't mentioned about this movie. And that's one of the reasons this movie is so amazing. There's so much in this movie that I didn't cover. It's style, it's story, and all the small details in this movie are so well thought through and detailed and delivered in such a good way. Not only that, but Coraline herself, you know, just reminds me of my wife in so many different ways and that makes me happy sometimes things in this world are just taken for granted and things aren't always what you want but you need to make the best of what you have because let's be real all of the glitters for example that you see on the internet or you see someone else's life you know sometimes those glitters don't equal gold and i know all of these things that people say like the motivational stuff is always tends to be cringe and cliche and i get that you know me telling you some motivational quote or giving you some sort of moral to summarize this movie isn't going to change how you think or make your life better if anything most of the time motivational quotes make you feel belittled and almost mocked because let's be real the only person who's dealing with the struggles is you but if there's one thing that you could take out of this review and this movie it's that you should subscribe to me now thank you so much for watching